one of the characteristics of living things is that they have to be able to metabolize. So they have to be able to take in energy from the environment and they have to be able to convert it into a form that they can use so that they can perform all the functions of life that they need to perform. And so in t today, what we're gonna be talking about is how bacteria gain energy and then how they turn around and um, go through some sort of process to release that energy, utilize that energy so that they can um, turn it into a form that they're gonna use to carry out the functions of life for them. So let's start with gaining energy. Um, gaining energy means that you've got to take it in somehow or you've got to produce it for yourself. And as we have um, said several times before, um, bacteria can either be autotrophs or heterotrophs. Um, now, the author of your book uses a table to organize this information. Um, I think um, branching diagrams will a lot of times kind of help you to visualize a little bit better um, how things are broken down. So that's why I've chosen to organize it this way. So um, there are two ways to gain energy. I can either do it as an autotroph or I can do it as a heterotroph. And so if you recall, an autotroph means that they're going to make their own energy. And so um, autotrophs um, can further be broken down into either photoautotrophs or chemoautotrophs. Now a photoautotroph is what we're most familiar with because plants would be photoautotrophs. They are gonna um, do photosynthesis, which means they're going to use light energy from the sun and carbon dioxide, and they're going to make um, the food that they need to survive. However, some bacteria are gonna use a product or use a process called chemosynthesis because they're chemoautotrophs. And in place of getting energy from the sun, they're gonna get energy from some sort of chemical reaction that they are running and then they're going to combine that with carbon dioxide to make the food that they need. Okay, so two types of autotrophs. There are also two types of heterotrophs. Heterotrophs can either be chemoheterotrophs or photoheterotrophs. Now there aren't a whole lot of these. They're, they're kind of an anomaly. There are a few of them. Um, they use energy from the sunlight just like um, the photoautotrophs do, but they don't use carbon dioxide. They have to use some other sort of organic compound in order to make the compounds that they need to survive. Okay, so again, just a few of these. The vast majority of bacteria are going to fall into the category of chemoheterotroph, and even chemoheterotrophs can be broken down into a couple of different categories. I can break them down into saprophytes, and the common name for a saprophyte is a decomposer or I can have a parasite. And again, those words should be familiar to you. We've had them before. Parasites are going to um, feed off of another organism um, at the expense of that organism. That organism is going to have harm done to it um, if, if they have a parasite. The saprophytes, again, and I'm gonna put a star by this one here because this is the vast majority of bacteria Vast majority of bacteria are saprophytes or decomposers. So they're going to get their energy from other types of, um, from compounds that are available to them, okay? So basically all of the energy here is going to come from organic compounds. Just like our energy all comes from organic compounds, okay? All right, so that is how um, bacteria are going to gain energy. They then have to take that energy. Um, we talked about cellular respiration before. We've talked about fermentation before. So they've got to take that and they have to convert that energy into a form that they can use. So when they release the energy, um, again, there are basically two ways you can do it. Um, you can have what's called an obligate aerobe. Obligate just means that you have to have something. Um, and so we are obligated to have oxygen because if we don't have oxygen, we die. And so bacteria that are obligate aerobes have to have oxygen in order to survive. And so they are going to require oxygen, O2 is oxygen, for cellular respiration. And we did a lot of um, study on, the, on how respiration works. And so they're going to do exactly what we studied about. They're gonna do cellular respiration in that way. Now, I also have what's called an obligate anaerobe. 
So an anaerobe is something that actually gets poisoned by oxygen. It doesn't want any oxygen. It will kill it if it comes in contact with oxygen. And so um, they are not going to use oxygen. And instead of respiration, which requires oxygen, they are going um, to get their energy by using fermentation. Um, we talked about uh, fermentation um, I think briefly, and we're going to hit it again when we get into um, the chapter on fungi where we're talking about yeasts and making of um, beers and wines and bread and things like that that require yeast and fermentation. But no oxygen is required for that. Um, there are amazingly, um, well, before I, before I go there, you're going to find an obligate anaerobe um, in a place, living in a place like a sealed jar. Uh, where, you know, sometimes if you've heard about home canning and if you don't cook the food um, well enough, then you can end up having uh, bacteria that are going to thrive in that sealed environment where there's no air. Um, you might find an obligate anaerobe in the muck at the bottom of a swamp where there's no oxygen down there. Okay, so there are places where, you know, there's not going to be any oxygen where these types of bacteria are going to thrive. Now, you also have... Um, some some bacteria that are called facultative anaerobes and they are very flexible because they can actually switch back and forth from either using um, cellular respiration that requires oxygen or using fermentation that does not require oxygen they can they can go back and forth depending on what the supply of oxygen is at the time so they are going to use um they're going to use both respiration and fermentation depending on oxygen supply okay if there's oxygen they'll do respiration if there's not they'll do fermentation so they can they can switch back and forth now a lot of bacteria are also going to have the characteristic that if the conditions are unfavorable they are able to form something called an endospore and so what that means is that they take their dna and their ribosomes and they put a really tough protective layer around it to, uh, to protect the DNA and the ribosomes. And then they actually kind of go into a dormancy period. And when the conditions once again become favorable for them, um, then that endospore will open up, the DNA and the ribosomes will begin functioning, and then the bacteria will kind of, um, I guess you could say they could wake up because they're in a dormant stage um, other than that. So be aware that there are ways that bacteria can survive if their um, surroundings do become unfavorable to life. So that is going to cover the metabolism of bacteria.